James Homer was a private investigator. He wasn't the kind hired by big insurance companies to catch fraudsters or wealthy politicians looking to dig up dirt on an opponent. No, James Homer dealt mostly in the relationship business. His clients, typically but not exclusively middle-aged married men and women, hired him to find or follow their spouse who's been spending too many late nights at the office or seems to be going out for drinks with the girls too often. On the night of June 7, 2019, James found himself in a familiar situation. He sat in his car in the parking lot of the Hotel West, a sleazy pay-by-the-hour type of place, absentmindedly listening to two men on the radio talk about a string of recent homicides. So, do the police think these are all connected? Do we have a serial killer in our midst? Well, Ted, that's the strange part. The killer has been found dead at each of these crime scenes as well as the victim. There's really no way these horrific deaths could be connected. Not in any way we can make sense of. James was outside the hotel because a housewife had sent him an email earlier that morning and described a typical story. Husband goes to work, comes home late, says he's going to the gym but is definitely not getting in better shape. The woman included a photo of her husband's car and license plate along with the addresses for his office and the gym he claimed to be frequenting. James hadn't followed the husband to the hotel, he had just made an educated guess that paid off. After a couple of decades in the PI business, there were recognizable patterns that provided some shortcuts. One such shortcut James found was to skip straight to the Hotel West when married folks were involved. Sure enough, on the night of June 7th, a few minutes after James arrived, the car from the photo that was emailed to him pulled into the lot. The driver, who James also recognized from a picture, had his arm draped around a pretty brunette in the passenger seat. James started to carefully photograph the couple from his dark corner of the parking lot. He snapped a few clear photos of them in the car and getting out, then patiently waited for them to go inside. Those images would be enough to confirm the wife's suspicions, but his clients usually wanted evidence a little more salacious for the divorce attorneys. He watched the front of the building until one of the room lights switched on. One of the best features of the Hotel West not for its guests, but for James and Peeping Toms, was its sheer dollar store curtains. The thin white fabric barely hid anything from the outside world. James began adjusting his zoom lens and began shooting the lovers as they undressed. There is a fine line between James' work and voyeurism. Or maybe there isn't. Either way, any personal thrill he had experienced from watching illicit affairs had long since faded. After everything he had seen, he wasn't remotely surprised when the woman tied the husband's wrist to the headboard and wrapped his necktie around his head as a blindfold. If he had learned anything from his time as a PI, it was that these types of kinks were more common than people like to believe. Now the woman was doing something James hadn't seen before. She was standing on the bed above the man holding her arms up toward the ceiling. Her forearms and head were cut off by the window, so it was impossible to see what she was doing from the car. Suddenly, the light in the room dimmed dramatically, and the woman crouched down, straddling the bound man. James lifted the viewfinder to his eye once more, adjusting the zoom lens to try and make out what the woman was holding in the dim light. She was rubbing it on the man's lips in a tantalizing fashion. It was a light bulb. A few more seconds passed, and the woman said something that prompted the man to open his mouth. She slipped the bulb over his jaw, and James cringed as the man's lips sealed around its base. Did he know what he held between his teeth? Did he know what would happen if he applied too much pressure? The woman got off the bed and stepped away from the window. James continued to take photos, but he felt a little nauseous. He considered taking what he already had and heading home before he witnessed something awful, but he couldn't quite bring himself to look away. The woman returned, jumping on the bed with something that flashed under the remaining light bulb in the ceiling. Returning to the viewfinder, James could see it was a lighter. She flicked it on and for a moment stared into the flame. She appeared lost in its orange and blue flicker. She snapped out of her trance and slowly extended the lighter to be beneath the man's chin. 
She raised her hand up carefully and brought the flame just under the man's jaw, which was still clenching the delicate glass bulb. James squirmed in his seat. He hoped whatever he was watching was consensual. The man didn't seem to be resisting or showing any sign that it wasn't. He only tilted his head a little whenever she held the flame too close to his skin. The woman continued to hold the lighter under his chin. She was manipulating him, forcing him to turn his head back and forth, tip it up, and then let it back down. Who was this enjoyable for? All at once it became clear that it was not the man. The woman grabbed his hair and held his head back. From his exposed throat, James could see the man was breathing hard and fast. He was sweating too. Still holding his head back, the woman held the lighter closer to the man's chin than ever before. James saw his entire body twitching and flailing. He was clearly trying to escape her restraints, but she had tied them well. A dark spot started to form on the man's jaw right above the little flame. He continued to struggle, but James knew it wouldn't be long before... Pop. He didn't actually hear it from the car, but James' imagination filled in the sound as the man's jaw closed around the light bulb in an involuntary attempt to escape the pain. The woman lifted his blindfold to stare into his wild, panicky eyes. Blood immediately started to trickle from the corners of his mouth. He coughed violently and sprayed shards of glass and gobs of blood across the bed. The woman was covered too in the shards and blood, but she didn't even seem to notice. She just stared into the dying man's eyes and smiled wickedly down upon him. James continued to take photos against his will. He was no longer gathering evidence for a divorce case, but rather a murder. He held the camera in one hand, and with the other, fished out his cell phone. He called 911 and told the dispatcher what he was seeing. At that point, the man was still writhing, restrained in the bed and apparently alive. There was still time, albeit not much, to save him. The woman jumped up on the bed suddenly, reaching up as she had before. The room went black. James could no longer see anything happening through the window. The police were on the way, but he wouldn't be able to live with himself if he just sat in his car and let the man die without trying to help. He ran to the front door, threw it open, and stumbled up against the desk where a ragged-looking man looked up, unbothered by James panting. "'Hey, Jim, you looking for them sweethearts that come in here?' "'Tony, listen to me,' James replied. "'The police are coming. When they get here, I need you to send them to whatever room that couple rented.' "'Okay. They're in three, Tony replied shiftily. James realized Tony was more likely to disappear at the sight of a cop than he was to lead them to the room. Just leave a note, he shouted as he ran towards room three. There was no light glowing under the door. The only sound coming from the other side was that of running water. James knocked and made it clear he wasn't interested in creating any trouble. He just wanted to help the injured man. There was no reply. Something flashed beneath the door. Red, then blue. The police had arrived. James returned to the, sure enough, empty reception desk and led the officers to room three himself. He had a graphic photo queued on his camera's digital display, and with one glance at it, an officer broke down the door. He lit up the room with his flashlight and revealed the ghastly scene to all present. The man lay unmoving on his bed. His eyes were open wide and bulged gruesomely. His lips were a tattered mess. Blood was still pouring from them and pooling on his chest and the bed around him. The white sheets were slowly being dyed red as they absorbed the mess. The carpet squished as the officers entered the room. Water spurted and bubbled out with each step. The woman was nowhere to be seen at first, but the sound of running water behind the closed door told the police where she would be found. One officer opened the door cautiously while another stood ready with her gun drawn. It wouldn't be necessary. The woman, the murderer, was slouched over the overflowing bathtub. She was on her knees with her head submerged. She was still, lifeless. James' memory flashed back to the radio broadcast he'd heard in his car just before the couple arrived at the hotel. Well, Ted, that's the strange part. The killer has been found dead at each of these crime scenes as well as the victim. 
The police asked James to return with them to the precinct where he turned over his camera to be downloaded. While he was giving a statement, an officer brought the camera back to him along with a few prints of his photos. Have you ever seen this before? The officer asked as he spread the photos out in front of James. In each one, the woman was outlined in a dark haze. It followed the movement of her arms as she unscrewed the light bulb, as she put it in the helpless man's mouth, and as she held the lighter to his skin. No, I've never... James started to answer, but trailed off as he remembered the radio again. There's really no way these horrific deaths could be connected. Not in any way we can make sense of. 